So before we give any like demo lesson, given that it's a CFA level one uh, in information seminar, so we will just tell you guys that what's the benefit that CFA can give it to you and just a brief introduction about like the financial market player. So as you know, like uh, for myself, I'm like basically on the buy side, I'm a buy side analyst. And then like my, my boss is a portfolio manager. But in my daily time, I also deal with like sell side analysts, as you can see. But sell side analysts, you can see research analysts, investment banker, or like corporate, and also others like accountants and also risk managers. So there are lots of jobs in the financial industry. I'm sure that like some of you are in one of the industry too. As what I mentioned, like we can see in a bank, you can see there is a investment banking, you can see asset management, and, and then there is also back office. So the category I'm in, in is the fund management uh, industry. Okay, so uh, what does CFA charter holder do? You can see that the majority, more than a quarter of the CFA charter holder is actually in the portfolio manager and research analyst type. And I can share with you my experience. It really depends on like which houses uh, you work for. Some houses actually they have a requirement that they want a CFA charter holder. Even though the time that you apply for the job, you're not yet a CFA uh, charter holder, but they want you at least you compete level one. You are like, you are towards level two, level three level, but some house they, they don't really have the requirement. But I can definitely uh, sure that having a CFA is a plus for you in terms of like uh, moving forward in your career. And there is some analysis that like CFA done that for the, for the charter holder, there's the major employers, as you can see, like, like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. So I, I work for Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank is one of them. And there is just some apps that we put on the slide that you can see why CFA is important. So I, I'm sure that like you may see that in refinance or other like recruitment websites, they basically will say that our oh, CFA qualification is preferred. Like research analysts is it's kind of like a must for them. They will, have, they will get a CFA uh, charter holder. And even you are like portal strategies, they will also mention about like CFA. So I think um, CFA is actually very well recognized. Like they know that you have to spend a lot of time in studying the curriculum and then get it passed. It's a three level exam. The passing rate is very low. Like later on we can, we can see how is the passing rate. So passing rate, as you know, we, we have three level and level one, you can actually take it in June and December time. So you can actually see like two passing score here. Uh, you can see like level one and level two, the passing rate is like that of the time is like below 50%. Level three is like sometimes you can get over 50%. So how does it get passed? Basically the rule of thumb is if you get 70% correct, then you basically can pass the exam, but don't think that 70% is actually easy. Have any one of you registered for the exam yet? Okay. Okay, so if, if for you register for the exam, probably you have always seen the curriculum. It's actually a, like huge curriculum. It's cover different topics. So that, that's the tough part we will touch on how to uh, get prepared for the exam. So for the entry requirement to take the CFA exam, it's like you either have a bachelor bachelor degree, don't need to be at US, you have a Hong Kong, UK bachelor degree, it's also fine. It's study your final year. If you don't have a bachelor degree, you have four year experience, you can also apply for for the exam. And here as we say, right, basically it takes three level to go. And there is no time limit in between. Let's say if you take level one and then you want to wait another five years to take level two, it's completely fine. Some people do it. And you can see here that people put minimum about like 300 hours in study for every level. And it's got like 10 topic cover. So here you can see like some, some of you maybe work for like equity investment. So you're very familiar with equity investment or fixed income. But actually for the CFA curriculum, it actually cover many different topics. So I know uh, actually a, a lot of my friends, they took the CFA exam. Some of them are very good at quantitative. They basically study statistics in their college. So they're good at one part quantitative, but given that CFA is a lot of, uh, a lot of topic in it, so they also have to focus more on like financial reporting or analysis. But if your background is more like accounting background, you can probably get this 
thing pass easily. But as I say, it's just too many material, and then it needs to spend a lot of time in doing it. So here you can see which part is more important. Like they say, quite a they basically quite diversify uh, across different subjects. You can see in level one and level two, they actually test you a lot about like financial reporting. And then level three, when you get into final level, they put the focus more on the portfolio management, which is more related to the fund management side. And the difference in terms of exam format, you can see level one and level two are multiple choices. And level three is uh, multiple choices plus essays. So some people find it difficult to write article in level three, but in this class, we're more focused on the uh, level one. So level one is basically multiple choices. A, B, C, you get about 240 questions for the whole day. Um, I would say that level one is focusing on the concept. So level two probably you involve more about calculation. Level three is like essay writing. So level one, as long as you get the concept right, familiar, familiar with the concept, you basically have a high chance in passing it. So as I mentioned before, if you get 70%, then you basically you can pass the CFA exam. And for those marginal students, they were based on ethics. Okay, some people think ethics is actually difficult to, uh, to study, but it's just some of it, some of the rules you actually have to remember. And like most of the answer are quite logical. It's nothing really ridiculous. For the ethics part, it's really based on you guys' own studying. Okay, so we have talked about that if you get got the curriculum, you can see that it's very complicated and long. And basically for myself, in my own study experience, when I first got the curriculum, I can only spend like probably five minutes in looking at one page and then I completely give up because they give you a lot of material. And then most of them, you don't really see it in the exam. So what I want, I just want to pass the exam it's, I'm not saying the curriculum is bad, but it just they give you all the things that you, you need to study while you're having a job. Like it's very difficult for you to finish the whole curriculum. So what I did by that time, I got like, a Swiser test book, which is like they give you what exam is going to, uh, what is the exam focus. And it's shorter and easier to understand. So that's what I did. And then end up, I don't think I have ever finished the curriculum at all. So, <laughs> so I just depend on the Swizer te uh, test book. And besides Swizer, I actually, I was studying Kaplan class. So the, the thing that I like about Kaplan class is like when you're so busy, you don't really have time to go through the curriculum. And when you read a book, like you don't have the framework given that it has so many topics. I want someone to talk it through first. And then I get the framework, I understand the concept, and then later on when I read the book by myself, I just find it so easy. So you can see that like they, they basically, if 30 pages of the task in curriculum, it's just turned into 16 slides. I think probably spend about 10 minutes, it's gone by 30 pages. But I, if I have to read it by myself, I would have spent about like probably more than two, three hours just reading the curriculum. So that's, that's the thing that I like the class. I actually study level two and level three through the cabin class. Level one, I was in New York, so I, I didn't do uh, any classes. And then the other thing is like practice question is very important. Um, basically, you can't find any old exam paper on the internet for, this, uh, for the CFA exam. There's no way you can find it. But like Kaplan and Swizer, they actually have a question bank. You, we, we will also give you a practice question during the class. And actually, uh, I think after a few class, we will also give you a progress test to just see like, you can see how yourself like understand the concept. If you think that you cannot really get it right, maybe it's time for you to spend more time in re re reset. And then we, we talk about how the like re revision costs help. And later on, I will give a demo lecture how I will teach a course. And then at the end is really the mock exam. The mock exam will be, will be taking place after all the revision costs. So you can see like what kind of score you can get. If you can get 70% out of it, probably is a good sign like you guys are going to pass the exam. 
Okay, now I'm going to give you guys a demo lecture about equity. So basically, before I get into security validation, I just want to show you uh, the reason I like the slide in Kaplan is you can see that the LOS 50 is basically you can uh, get refer to the CFA textbook page 244, or you if you get the Swiser textbook, you can get uh, go to page 293. You can get the details about what I have talked and also make a reference. You can make a preparation before you came to the class. So security valuation. So most of the time you heard people say about, okay, this stock is very good, like good management, good platform, and then good growth, uh, growth prospect. But does it mean that we actually have to buy it now? Or is the price really make sense? I think we have a lot of discussion like, especially let's say when Hong Kong stock exchange is $300, everyone will say, oh, it's a good buy, Hong Kong, Hong Kong market keep going up, the stock exchange volume is up, but 300 is, is it a cheap price? Looking back now, you would think that definitely not, not a cheap price, right? So the whole security valuation is teaching you guys like, okay, w right now you look at the market price and then you make your own analysis to see what's the estimate value. So let's say if your estimate value of this like Hong Kong stock exchange is 200, then in this case, the stock has already overvalued. You shouldn't buy it. So what we believe in security analysis is everything has a price. Even you see a doji, uh, I shouldn't say doji, but even you say some company which you think there's no growth prospect and the management is not, is not good at all, but then everything has some value. So if they sell out the whole company, what will be the value of it? So what is the value compared with the current market price? So that's whole thing uh, about security valuation. So there are three methods we will talk about. Uh, for the security analysis. There, there is something you get the absolute price, like the discounted cash flow model. So you get your personal value of all your future uh, uh, cash flow. So there is two ways, right? So one is dividend discount, one is free cash flow. So when do we use dividend? When do we use free cash flow? So for some company, they don't really have a regular dividend payout policy, or they just pay out like 20, 30%. Then you cannot use that cash flow to back out to calculate your person value. But for other company, let's say for a uh, REIT, like Link REIT, Champion REIT, or Fortune REIT, they have to pay out 90% or 100% of the dividend, dividend. So they have actually stable payout ratio, then you can add use the dividend discount model. But for other company which doesn't have a stable dividend payout, then you will use a free cash flow uh, to equity model to get their discounted cash flow. So in the class, we will teach you like uh, how to do all this calculation. And, and then you what we were talking about is absolute value, but then when in the stock market, you heard that people say a lot about PE, PB, that's a relative valuation. But like PE and PB is all like, am I saying that it stopped with like 10 PE in, in uh, let's say in car industry, it's cheaper than a 10 PE in the technology industry? No, cannot. Because PE, basically, or PB is you have to compare with other stock with a similar uh, company profile or in the same industry. So PE is a, is a relative valuation methodology. And then not every stock you can use PE. The only reason is some of the company, their earning is very bumpy, uh, is that very bumpy actually. You maybe one year, they get um, 100 million next year, they basically don't have like income flow. So PE is not applicable to every company. And then I think rule of thumb is everyone was saying about, okay, low PE is the best one. But then some of the cynical business, like the heavy industry one, they're earning actually at the peak of the business cycle. So in this case, when their PE is very low, it's actually not the time you invest in them because their earnings are already at the peak cycle. That, that time, we a you actually want to pick those stock when the PE is actually at the highest because the earning is at the, is at the, is at the turnaround corner. That's the time that you have to look at PE based on the industry and based on their uh, competitors. And we also use EV to EBITDA is another multiple methodology. You have to, make, uh, you have to do the calculation, but the calculation is quite simple in the exam. 
Another thing is like uh, asset base. Asset base is like just think about right now if I want to like sell the whole company, how much like net asset value can I actually get? So you, you the formula is quite simple. You use total asset minus your liability and preferred stock value. And total asset, it's really real estate company is kind of easy to say because like for the total asset. In uh, on the balance sheet for real uh, real estate, you basically price if not investment property, if a development property, you price it at cost. So you basically revalue it and see what is the current valuation of the total asset on the book. You minus the liability and also the preferred uh, share. You get the NAV. That's how you get the value of of the company. And in Hong Kong. Most of the public company they actually trade at, their, at a discount to their NA to their NAV. So the reason can be people don't trust the book, can be people don't trust the management. There is always a discount to it. But in Japan, people actually use the NAV as a to given their target price what they think about um, the valuation should be for for that particular public company. Okay, so. I just give a quick update for CFA program and also the demo class. Is there any particular question you guys are interested? No questions? <laughs> so only one person have registered for the exam. You guys still thinking about if you should do it or not? What are your hesitation? I would, I think at least like four months ahead of the exam. Yeah, Beca and, and if you see our program actually start in uh, March time, right? Like at the end of February. Yeah, so it's about four months before the exam. I think that that's the time, yeah. So you still have time to register for the exam. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So we basically will give you the slide in in the class. Yeah, you you have all the presentation slide. Yep. Yep. Nothing. Nothing more. Any questions? Hmm. Well, I want to share my ex yeah. I think they are completely different thing. CPA is more just accounting focus. Yeah, so I, I don't think CPA is particularly easier for, for, for someone. But actually, I want to share my background. Like, my undergraduate was a psychology degree. So I basically didn't study any finance. And then uh, I was a journalist before, as I mentioned. So you, you, you can say that I also didn't study any finance in, in college. But for me, picking up the CFA, as I say, when I first start with the curriculum, I basically I really want to give up because so m much material I couldn't really finish it and I didn't know any of the work right because I didn't study in the college for someone who did a finance degree in college probably they find it very easy but then I was just like okay people recommend the Schweizer textbook and I just like okay started with Schweizer textbook it's actually they present it in a very simple easy way and you just think about that like uh, I, I mentioned about it actually cover a different topic Okay, so I would probably think about if you don't have any math background, you will find the quant part and derivative part are uh, quite difficult, right? They're, they're more about like numbers. But for other things, by studying on the textbook, you can actually, I would say, understand about like 70% of it if you study the textbook, join the class. And it doesn't really require you to have a finance background at, at all, yeah.
overall aggregate. But when you get the result score, they actually will tell you what was the score you get in every part. But like there is some part, maybe some people were weak at corn, but if you get 100% correct in economics, it's, it can compensate. And you can see that like, the actually the big part is like financial reporting. And if you're interested in CPA, actually financial reporting is a big part of CFA program. And I, I would think about, let's say what you want to do, right? If, if you want to actually get into like a buy side, sell side, or, or other, other banking role, actually CFA give you a more overall program instead of just a accounting, accounting background. Accounting is very important too, but it's just completely different things. Because I was in New York. <laughs> I think it's really, uh, I think the textbook definitely helped me a lot. And then at the end, I think the final final one month, I actually, I think I finished all the studying one month before the exam. Final one month, I just do question. So there is a question bank, as I mentioned, for, from the Swiser. Uh, the Swiser textbook, you can buy separately. You can, yeah. And also the question bank, you can also buy separately. Yeah, yeah. So I actually the, just picked a question and go. And I just finished my master, so I didn't really have time to go to the Kaplan class at the time. Yeah. Yep. FRA, financial reporting. Yeah, corn is more statistic. Yeah. So what's the Oh, okay. Uh, I actually, I will, I will keep ethics at the end because you need to memorize something to go for the exam. So I always keep this at, at the end. And then I basically, I will, st I will actually start with financial reporting first. At the end, uh, when you have time, I will visit the financial reporting just because it's a such a big part of the exam. And in accounting, there is actually some rules you also have to remember. So I just think put everything which based on memory at, at the end. And for something I can understand, like just ba like corn statistic and also deferative is really based on how much you can understand the concept, right? Not much you actually have to memorize. So I will, I will after FRA, I will do corn and deferative. And then in the middle, I will do equity and fixed income. Yeah. Yeah, th that's, that's the thing that I say, the curriculum is actually too overwhelming. They give you everything. Actually, if you see the curriculum, the fixed income, economic, they give you way too much material. Like most of them are you are not going to see in the exam. Like I cannot forecast what it's going to see in the exam, but it's just like over the past few years, they have increased a lot of material in the economic and fixed income part, but students say that they don't really see it in the exam day. So they just give you extra information for your study. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also better. <laughs> yeah. I the, as I as I told you guys honestly, I, I didn't go through the curriculum at all. I just based on Swiser and also the uh, CFA course. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure, maybe I just uh, quickly go through some, some of the key parts. So I think you're familiar, read, familiar with that, like CFA, we basically have three levels. So we actually pinpoint that like in three levels, we have different passing score, and the passing score is actually quite low. And, and the exam is actually, I would say it, it's, it's quite difficult. For, for level one and two, you can see most of, most of the year actually passing score is below 50%. It's only level three, you can have some, like more than 50%. But it doesn't mean that level three is easier. You, if you can imagine a lot of people taking level one and then they get into level two. For those getting to level three, they are very familiar with all this topic. And among them is only 50% pass, yeah. So, and then uh, the other key part is, I was, 
I was telling the class that the like, CFA program is actually a lot of uh, topic got covered. And some of you are familiar with equity investment, but may not be familiar with um, economics or quantitative methods. So if you have to go through the curriculum by yourself, it's actually quite difficult because they give you a lot of extra material you have to study. So our recommendation is really like, we find that Swizer textbook is actually quite useful because they actually shorten the content, give you the exam focus. And then in the class, we will also walk you through the like concept of, of the basic knowledge in, in the curriculum. And then here we were just saying about like each part of the topic, it's represent like, let's say ethic 15%, economic 10%. And you can see uh, financial reporting is a key part. So I would recommend that you start with the financial reporting first. And then at the end, before you still have time, uh, before the exam, you, you re reset your financial reporting. And at the end, you go with ethics. Ethics is very important too, so make sure you pass the ethics because for someone who don't get 70% score to pass, they will base on your ethics score to see if you're good enough to pass the exam. Let's say if you get 67, then they will see how your ethics is doing. And I, I found like ethics, it does take some time for you to go through the like uh, practical questions and also the materials. And here is what we cover. Basically, for the whole day, you will have to face like 240 questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for so basically, you don't know which topic they are going to test you in the morning, OK? But every question is based on one topic. So let's say this topic is about equity. So you will see all these like questions under, under the same session of equity. They won't mix it like fixed income and equity in one session. No, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, Christy, do you want to get cover this? Yeah, yeah. Any question particularly related to CFA or industry? Uh, so what I, what I was telling the class is I find level one is more, if you understand the concept, you, you can pass it. Level two is more about like you have to do the math. Level three is essay, but like, so you cannot find any old exam paper on the internet. So what we do here is like, in the class, after a few class, we will give you a progress test to see how you guys are doing. At the end, we will have a mock exam. And then if you like, you can actually buy the Swizer uh, question bank. So you can continue doing some pretty exam by yourself. And I find it helpful because sometimes you think that you understand it, but when people fine tune the question, you suddenly like, okay, do I actually know it? So, so I think practice exam is actually is actually quite useful. For um, see, you there's definitely some calculation you have to do. Let's say there is like fixed income topic, you have to calculate all these like person value. Then with the calculator, it's actually easy that you just put in what was the time period, what was the future value, what was the like uh, PMT payment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say calculation is probably 20% of it. 80% is really testing you if you understand the concept. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, in the class, we probably won't run through how to use the financial calculator because when you buy it, they actually have the manual that it can show you how to use it. But anyway, like in the class, they <laughs> okay. But anyway, we will have some pretty question in the class. So if anyone don't know how to use a calculator, just come to me. I can teach you how to use it because I have mine too. Yeah. What's
you were going to ask something. Right? No, right. I don't think the yeah. So no one actually get the past exam. So so the pa old paper, the past exam paper, you can't find it on the internet. And that question bank question are not from the. Uh, See, I, I try it by myself. I would think that if I can get it 70%, so I actually, I'm quite confident I'll pass it. I think that the, I would say probably the similarity is like 80% between them. So I actually, I think it's kind of a good indicator for, for you to use the question bank. And the good thing about the question bank is like, they actually have lots of questions based on, let's say, equity. So you just keep doing the equity part and see if you can understand every aspect of it. And then now you think that before the exam, you think, oh, I really bad at derivative. So you just go to the derivative part and finish all the question over there. It's a kind of refresh your memory. Yep. Doesn't have to be finance. Yep. Okay, so let Christy talk about the curriculum.